Thank you for the opportunity uh, to present these two cases. So, we are discussing two cases. One is from hepatology and another is from gastroenterology. So, first case is a 45 year old male who presented in uh, developed fever followed by jaundice and after 6 days developed encephalopathy in the form of uh, altered sensorium and he, he grade 2 encephalopathy. On examination he has tachycardia, icterus and uh, hepatomegaly. So, on investigation, total bilirubin was 18 with coagulopathy INR of 3.9 with enzymes in the ranges of thousands. Platelet count is normal, ammonia levels and lactate levels are elevated. So, what is the diagnosis? So, we have uh, here whenever there is a liver injury and then uh, elevation of liver enzymes and jaundice this phase is called viral hepatitis. So, once coagulopathy sets in due to the failure of the hepatocytes, then it is called coagulopathy, then it is called severe acute liver injury and once encephalopathy sets in, it is called acute liver failure. And this acute liver failure, some people can undergo spontaneous recovery and also some people will be requiring transplant. So, Enasel defines it as an encephalopathy of any grade jaundice and coagulopathy developing in a patients without underlying liver disease and the and onset of encephalopathy within 4 weeks of onset of jaundice. So, exception to this normal liver underlying liver is hepatitis B, autoimmune and Wilson. So, if the encephalopathy develops within a 1 week, it is called hyperacute and otherwise within 1 to 4 weeks, it is called acute. So, uh, for critical care, we need to know the mimickers of acute liver failure that is other malaria, dengue, scrub and leptospirosis also. So, when to suspect these mimickers? So, when is when fever is the predominant symptom when presenting to the hospital or it is associated with any thrombocytopenia or multi-organ dysfunction like hepatitis, AKI, encephalopathy exist together or if INR does not worsen unless DIC sets in and ALT less than 1000, we suspect mimickers. So, this is a question to you, identify this uh, young male presenting with uh, fever, altered sensorium, AKA and hepatitis, yeah, it is Ishkar. So, uh, seen in scrub typhus with and there can be some etiological clues. Why to identify the etiological clue? Because we have some specific cause specific treatment in case of ALS, ALF which can reverse this condition and some clues are for hepatitis A, E, there can be history of prodrome and similar cases in family or community as they can occur in epidemics and any recent travel history and hepatitis B, there can be family history of hepatitis B or CLD, unsafe sexual practices, history of IV drug abuse, history of dialysis or tattooing, these risk factors have to be asked. And hepatitis C unlikely to present as ALF unless co-infected with hepatitis B. So, drugs, it is not just the allopathic drugs, every drug history has to be taken including the health supplements and neutroceuticals and the drug and in injury can occur within 6 months of the introduction of the drug. And there is a case report where just a uh, slimming uh, powder called Herbalife has caused acute liver failure. So, other rare uh, causes of ALF, Wilson's, there can be family history of Wilson or any history of neuropsychiatric manifestations previously in the patient and very rarely we can see Kaiser Fleischer ring that is this brownish ring around it although it is commonly seen with a slit lamp. And other rare etiology is herpes simplex, you can uh, in 30 to 30 percent of the patients of ALF due to HSV you can see this uh, herpes simplex uh, vesicular lesions and it is seen in either immunocompromised state or pregnancy and these patients often have persistent fever. So, what are the other lab patterns which can give a clue to the etiological diagnosis? In paracetamol poisoning causing ALF, the enzymes will be in thousands often more than 3000 and bilirubin is low. And in Wilson, you see that we observe that AST to ALT ratio will be more than 2 and also, the bilirubin will be high and patient often has Coombs negative hemolysis with low ALP 
and progressively uh, progressive AKI. In HSV, it is called anecteric hepatitis where bilirubin is often low and enzymes are elevated with associated leukopenia. We need a detailed evaluation of the etiology because we have a cost specific treatment for hepatitis B, we have antivirals, for acetaminophen we have an, an acetylcysteine and for autoimmune hepatitis we, we have steroids and Wilson's ALF we can use plugs with P, FFP as bridge to transplant and in acute butchery we have tips. And in acute fatty liver of pregnancy and help delivery uh, reverses the condition. So in the index case IgM HEV turned out to be positive and uh, NSTL cysteine was given and it was uh, now uh, NSL also recommends it to be used in all ALF because of safety though data is uh, more in PCM paracetamol poisoning. So coming to the next question which fluid has to be used for in uh, resuscitation in ALF. So is it NS, hydroxy, ethyl starch, 5% dextrose or albumin. So normal saline or plasmalate has to be the crystalloid of choice. We need to avoid hypotonic fluids because of worsening risk of uh, worsening of cerebral edema and albumin is not recommended and in view of risk of AK avoid hydroxy ethyl starch. So and lactate elevation as seen in our index case can be initially due to hypovolemia and it can be reversible but persistence later after resuscitation can be due to reduced liver clearance or catecholamine induced muscle production. So this patient is having mild hyponatremia with coagulopathy. So what should be the target of uh, sodium in patients with ALF? So of the three, so the target recommended is between 140 to 150. So we need to monitor sodium frequently and rapid correction uh, should be avoided. And so although this target sodium of 150 to 140 to 150 t 150 is used for prophylaxis in high risk patients but it doesn't have any sufficient data so when to ventilate a patient in alf cases so of three all grade 3 and grade 4 encephalopathy patients of alf needs mechanical ventilation and hyperosmotic drugs like hypertonic saline or mannitol has to be used hypertonic saline is preferable over mannitol and no role of lactulose or rifaximin or lola as seen in chronic liver disease there is no role in acute liver failure so uh, can anyone identify this image yeah optic nerve sheath diameter this can be a non invasive imaging bedside done for evaluating uh, raised ict normally is less than or equal to 5 serial monitoring is more important and one more important is Avoid hypoglycemia, uh, it can be seen in more than 50% of cases of ALF, just maintain it to be more than 100 at the same time avoid hyperglycemia. So usually majority of the uh, liver transplant centers follow prophylactic antibiotics and antifungals. So uh, role of ammonia in a short note, it has a prognostic value and has to be monitored in all patients of ALF. So to summarize. ALF can have a variable course and hence close monitoring is required at a liver transplant center and etiological evaluation is important for specific cost specific treatment and support to care is very important for better outcomes and dynamic monitoring can help, so help us to take a decision on the timing of liver transplant. So uh, this is regarding the ALF, this is predominantly made for the uh, students, residents. So, uh, we will be moving on to the case 2. So, 55 year old female who presented with acute onset upper abdominal pain with vomiting, abdominal distension and constipation and fever for last 2 days of 100 degrees. So, on examination she has tachycardia and abdomen showed tense abdomen with rigidity in the upper abdomen. So, uh, the common differentials at this point would be any acute bowel obstruction, acute pancreatitis or acute cholecystitis. So usually in critical, uh, in emergency we order an abdominal x-ray, ultrasound, abdomen and blood investigations. So and whenever we order x-ray, please order it in a proper way, whether it has to be supine, erect, PA, AP view. For example, see this patient where in a pain abdomen. Uh, 
and we got an abdominal x-ray uh, with chest x-ray with uh, both domes of diaphragm done in supine position and when it is done in erect you can see the air under the diaphragm. So, always any investigation has to be properly ordered and this is the x-ray of the index case. Here we can see a sentinel loop of small bowel loop dilated because of the local inflammation and uh, these are x-rays in other cases where proper study of x-ray can help us in etiological diagnosis. In this case, we can see the calcified gallstones and this is another case of pain abdomen where there is dilated small bowel loops with multiple air fluid levels confirming the diagnosis of, of acute small bowel obstruction. So, some clinical pearls in acute abdomen. So, whenever there is an uh, initially periumbilical pain and then it transformed to the right lower quadrant. Uh, then uh, we need to suspect appendicitis and uh, we can find uh, tenderness at the McBurney's point that is a junction of two thirds from the umbilicus and the right superior iliac spine and next any uh, pain in the epigastric region or right upper quadrant radiating to the infrascapular right infrascapular region suspect GB pathology like cholecystitis and whenever there is an acute upper abdominal pain radiating to the back from T10 to L2 levels suspect pancreatitis and whenever there is any severe pain, intolerable pain, but when you examine the patient you will find a soft abdomen and when there is a discorrelation between the severity of pain and the examination findings with high lactate suspect mesenteric ischemia. So, coming to the index case, so we have a suspicion of acute pancreatitis. So, in the emergency which test do you order whether amylase, lipase or both. So, am I, uh, coming to some pitfalls of amylase, the pattern of rise usually it rises within five, few hours and normalizes in 5 hours. In the index case, uh, the patient presented at day 6, so this can be falsely low. So, lipase can help in this case and uh, also in some cases there can be false negative amylase levels like hypertriglyceridemia or acute and chronic pancreatitis or false positive case like renal failure, macroamylasia or gynecological disorder. So, coming, comparing amylase and lipase both are pretty good in diagnosis, but when you want a patient presence late you prefer lipase and also there is no role of amylase and lipase in assessing the prognostic value and never repeat the tests again after the diagnosis because they have no role at all. So, dual testing is not superior, no prognostic value, please do not repeat. So, on ultrasound you can uh, see the uh, ultra bulky pancreas confirming the diagnosis of pancreatitis, gallstones are seen and see the ALT, AST levels of 260 and 180. This gives a clue to the diagnosis of biliary etiology as a as cause of pancreatitis. So, we confirm the diagnosis of pancreatitis at least two of the following has to be there upper abdominal pain, elevation of amylase or lipase at least three, three times and imaging which need not be CT. So, uh, how can we get to a diagnosis of etiology for gallstones patient can give a history of biliary colic or elevation of ALT or AL, AST at least 2 to 3 times in first 2 to 3 days gives more than 90 percent specificity as biliary etiology of uh, acute pancreatitis. And alcohol, few months of alcohol intake usually do not precipitate pancreatitis, usually it occurs after 5 to 5 years of heavy alcohol consumption. And in rarely we can see cases of uh, Patients with xanthalesma or this family history of dyslipidemia or if the blood we can on sampling the blood taking of the blood we can see the white lipid layer within the sample and these suggest the hypertriglyceridemia as a cause of pancreatitis. And in any patient with recurrent gall, uh, renal stones you uh, evaluate the patient for hypercalcemia as cause of pancreatitis. So, contrast CT when do you do it? It is not required for diagnosis definitely. But when the diagnosis in, is in doubt, please do it. And so, routine use is not unwar unwarranted. And if you want to assess the severity of pancreatitis, please do it after 72 hours only. Because in first 72 hours, necrosis, necrosis uh, sets in and also involves more areas in the first 3 days. 
So after three days, it will give a proper assessment of severity of pancreatitis. So when diagnosis is in doubt, please do CT or for assessment of severity and local complications, then do it after three to five days. And in if the patient with acute pancreatitis come to us, which fluid do you we prefer and how do we give it and how to monitor it? So our studies have shown that Ringer lactate has advantage and is the preferred. Uh, fluid for resuscitation and recent study published in NEGM have proven that moderate resuscitation is beneficial because of lower risk of fluid overload compared to aggressive resuscitation. So um, we can assess the hypovolemia by many measures in acute pancreatitis either clinically or based on urine output or blood pressure. So next most important thing is how to uh, get the symptomatic improvement like for analgesia in the patient because that is the most concerning factor for the patient whether to use NSAIDs or whether to use opioids. So there is a safety concern like for NSAIDs we have renal failure or risk of ulcers, peptic ulcers due to NSAIDs or with opiates there will be risk of ileus and respiratory depression. So for any how to choose? So based on clinical patient condition, if a patient has respiratory failure and not intubated, so avoid opiates and go for NSAIDs. If there is AKA, go for opioids it based on that. And always patient controlled analgesia pump is preferable and require lower doses than uh, nurse uh, analgesia given by nurses. So, so in our patient also there is a low grade fever. So should we give prophylactic antibiotics? It is a big no. It is not recommended at all unless there is an extra pancreatic infection like either pneumonia or UTI or uh, cholangitis. And coming to nutrition in first week of acute pancreatitis, it is the only intervention that has proven to have mortality benefit in acute pancreatitis and it reduces the risk of future infections also. So which is the preferred route? Always oral or enteral is the preferred over parenteral and when to start feed, feeding as soon as possible but preferably within 48 to 72 hours because early enteral nutrition has mortality benefit in acute pancreatitis. Never keep the patients nil per oral for days together. And which is the preferred feeding formula? No need of any elemental diet, please follow polymeric diet. And what is the route? If a patient accepts orally, give him orally. If there is a body pain or vomiting or anything, try nasogastric tube. If not tolerate, go for a nasogastric tube. So uh, summarizing the nutrition, if uh, look for any contraindication to enteral nutrition like raised intra-abdominal pressure or any uh, severe vomitings, anything. If there is any contraindication, just look for if any underlying malnutrition is present. If yes, initiate parenteral nutrition. If there is no malnutrition, you can wait at maximum of 7 days. If it is more than 7 days, please initiate and parenteral nutrition so that patient does not go into malnutrition. So concluding approach to any acute abdomen, do a rapid assessment, rule out life threatening abdominal catastrophe and also uh, hemodynamic resuscitation has to be done prior to uh, di making a diagnosis of the patient and also do not wait to give analgesia prior to making a diagnosis. Just give analgesia as soon as the patient comes and keep him comfort. So summarizing my case, a proper diagnosis of abdominal pain requires uh, resident or uh, practitioner to be familiar with patterns of abdominal pain and also be familiar with classic and common pathologies. And immunocompromised people cannot do not present in a typical way, so they can have a vague and poorly localized pain. And history and see especially serial examinations is very important in pain abdomen. And also create a differential diagnosis based on our evaluation and then support your findings with testing. And thank my teachers for uh, creating interest in my clinical medicine. And I thank my alma mater and all the audience for their patient hearing. Thank you all.